Well, it is so good to be with all of you here tonight, and uh, this is really what marks our first kind of Lexington campus kickoff event. A uh, couple of things that we're really hoping to work toward as a campus is first to just develop a lot of our congregational life together. We, we have a great crowd that's here on Sundays and some great small groups, but we want to help everyone get to know just a wider spread of folks here around our community. So we hope to do some events like this that are very discipleship focused, but also have a great uh, opportunity for you to meet other people. And so typically for lectures, that this is going to be more of a, a talk than kind of a lecture, but typically you're sitting in rows, and we decided to have you in tables so that you can interact a little bit more with each other at different points uh, tonight and just sort of give you a better chance to get to know one another. So it kind of helps us with our initiatives toward congregational life. And then one of the things that we are really committed about and passionate here for the future of our church is that we would help equip each and every one of you to help take your place as a leader and contributor in God's kingdom mission wherever that might be, in your workplace, within your family, within your neighborhood. And we'll get a great chance to hear some more about that as uh, Dr. Black comes to speak in a, in a little bit. But I'm excited so that we can talk about these sorts of things and have some great conversations together around this. And tonight's event is actually sponsored by uh, a pastor's network that I'm a part of called the Made to Flourish Pastor's Network. It's kind of based out of Waukesha, Wisconsin, and these are some very generous people uh, from the Kern Family Foundation that are sponsoring a lot of great initiatives to help train a lot of pastoral leaders, uh, engineers, and, and educators. So it's kind of like the trifecta of awesomeness. Pastors, engineers, and educators. But I'm glad to be a recipient of some of that. And so they have actually are hosting an event this weekend that I'll be a part of for uh, a small group of pastors here locally that, uh, that Gary Black will be speaking at. And, and since he was coming Friday and Saturday, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get him to come to Grace Chapel here on Thursday? And and they said, Let, that's great. Uh, and so, and then I kind of pushed them a little step further. I said, instead of having him come all the way from California, wouldn't it be just as easy for all of us to, to leave New England and go to California? <laughs> that was very logical. And they disagreed with me on, on, on that. So we're glad that uh, he could be here with us tonight. And um, Dr. Black, he is uh, the professor at uh, a professor of theology at Azusa Pacific University out in California. He is the author of the, the book, The Theology of Dallas Willard, and then uh, the co-author of Dallas's kind of last book here, The Divine Conspiracy Continued. And Gary was at a pretty cool place before he came here. He, he was telling me that in between, or before he was in California where he normally lives, just last week he was in in a place that required a lot of sacrifice for a Christian leader to go. And he was speaking at a conference in the Hawaiian island of Oahu. And he thought it was great, but he said, really, I'm more looking forward to coming to the hub of the universe, you know, the great city of Boston, and specifically Lexington, Massachusetts, the home of the American Revolution. And uh, so we're great to have him here. And we're going to be talking a lot about revolution you know, Dallas Willard's works really have incited a revolution amongst a lot of thinkers and leaders, and it's a return almost back to what the original followers of Jesus were like, that they were actually doing the very things that Jesus said and commanded. They were trying to orient and arrange their whole lives so they wouldn't just know what Jesus knew, but they would actually do what Jesus did. Uh, a man named Dr. Gary Moon, who heads up the Dallas Willard Center for Spiritual Formation in Santa Barbara, California, he actually has said that he believes Dallas's works are going to be just as important as what Martin Luther's works were. 500 years ago, and Dallas has passed away a couple years ago, and his works continue to be so, so widespread and influential. And um, how many, just out of curiosity, have any familiarity with Dallas's books here, besides hearing me quote Dallas Willard nonstop at church? Yes, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, his kind of main book, The Divine Conspiracy, is what we'll be talking a little bit more about tonight. But it's essentially about how God wants to subvert evil with good and how we can be a part of that revolution. And it's a revolution that begins within our hearts as our hearts are changed and transformed because we live from our hearts. And so political... Uh, change is not going to incite the change that we're hoping for. That different economic systems aren't necessarily going to bring about the change that we're hoping for. But only as people's hearts are renovated to have hearts like Jesus, 
Do we have any chance and hope in our world? And so that's what Dallas was all about and, and what he wants us as, as, as Christ followers to be about as well. And I, I had a few chances to interact with Dallas personally. I'll never forget one of the questions that he shared at this uh, class that I took in the, the Rocky Mountains when we, I was in seminary out in Denver. And, and Dallas said, what God gets out of your life is the person that you become. What God gets out of your life is not what you do, it's not what kind of recognition you receive, not how many degrees you earn, but what God gets out of your life is the person that you become. And at that time in my life, that was the most important thing I possibly could have heard. And it has brought about so much freedom in my life to be able to find my identity in Christ and to be able to live with, by being able to relinquish the outcomes all the time. I don't have to live with all that pressure because God doesn't care how well I perform as much as he cares about who we can become, and that is to become like Christ. But becoming like Christ is always for the sake of the world and for the sake of others. And that's where the divine conspiracy continues, right here. And that's where we'll pick up tonight. And if you would, please welcome Dr. Gary Black, Jr. Here, give him a big Grace Chapel welcome. So glad to have him here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it is, uh, it is really a pleasure to be with you. Now, I have been traveling quite a bit uh, over the last uh, few months, and I was just in Hawaii, and y you can't convince anybody that you're working in Hawaii. I mean, you just can't. And, um, and then the next thing people always ask is, did you bring your wife? And I didn't, right, which is even worse. Uh, they started looking at me like, wow, you, you had to go to Hawaii and you didn't take your family? What a loser you are, which is what they thought too. Um, but I didn't, I, I kept telling, I, 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 got, I had a little bit of time to go to the beach. And I knew I couldn't go to the beach because if they asked me if I went to the beach, it would just make it worse. And so I just stayed in the hotel the whole time. So don't you feel sorry for me now? You do, right? I went all the way to Hawaii and I didn't even get to the beach. So I came home, uh, this was like on Monday, today's Thursday, right? So Monday from Hawaii, and I kind of unpacked and then repacked and then spoke uh, last night at Westmont College. And as I was packing, uh, my wife said, uh, and she kind of helps me, I'm not a very good packer, I don't like to pack at all. For, it's kind of like um, fashion origami to me. I don't really get, I don't really like to pack very much. And um, so she was kind of going, okay, so you need this. And she looks on her phone, right? And she, it's going to be cold. And so she says, well, I think, uh, I think you should pack a sweater. And I go, oh, okay, where are my sweaters? I mean, we, haven't, we, we live in California. And I, I go, um, do, where are the sweaters? Well, she goes, well, I'll go looking for one. And so she goes, when's the last time you wore a sweater? And I said, well, I think I wore a sweater in January because I had an early tea time, and it was like 55 and she goes, yeah, tell them that. They'll throw hockey pucks at you or something. <laughs> that it was so cold in January, you needed a sweater to play golf. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not going to tell you that story. <laughs> so then, uh, so then we're, they're here. but here, here's, here's what, really what I want to tell you. So my folks lived here uh, for like five or six years down uh, on, in one Devonshire, you know, that it's one of the, one of the high-rises downtown, right near Faneuil, Faneuil Hall. Did I say it right? Is it an F, a PH? I don't really know. But it was great food. So we had, like, Ye Old Oyster House. Is, is that it? Ye Old Oyster House? That where Paul Revere drank or something. That's what they said. <laughs> or eight oysters. That was awesome. And we did that like every, every year. And then we, some, most of the time we tried to arrange it around 4th of July where the Redcoats would come and then the shooting and, the, and then they would read the, con, the Declaration of Independence, not the Constitution. That would have been a lo little longer deal. Uh, right? Is it the Declaration that they read from the church? Am I getting that right? Yeah. This really happened. I am not just making it up as I'm standing here. It happened like more than once, too. So that, that was a lot of fun. And then we walked the red line to, to the trail and then saw the boat. And then... Uh, 
And they turned it around, every right? They like backed it up and put it back in, right? I don't remember why they did that, but there was a story about that, that they turned it around every year, right? And, um, oh, and, and the North End. We would have this amazing Italian food at the North End, right? And so, and I got to go to uh, 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 a Red Sox game. I'm a baseball fan. I played baseball in college. And so I got to go to, to Fenway, and, and we got put right behind a pillar. And so I got to watch, like, Kurt Schilling. Oh, what was it? You know, there's this, I don't, you know... Anyway, so we, we got to see, we had the obstructed view seats, that's what they were. That's all that was left, and so they gave them to people from California. And um, <laughs> so when I come back here, I mean, I have a lot of really fun memories. The kids were young, and oh, the baked, the baked bean guy with the dog. <laughs> Remember that? You don't know what I'm talking about? Who's the guy with the baked beans? Bush. Bush. Bush's baked beans with the dog. Okay, so he was in the part of the parade, and we would eat baked beans. I thought you would know what I was talking about. <laughs> Isn't he your guy? He's not your guy. Okay. He thinks he is, I think. <laughs> um, so we had, a lot of, we had a lot of fun memories during those years when the kids were young and, and those family vacations. And, um, but here's, here's the thing I'm, I'm, I'm going to be serious about. When you travel around, it, it's easy to feel like you're disconnected and that you're a little bit of a sojourner and you're in a distant land. And I sit back there and I hear you sing two songs and I know I'm home. We can find the body of Christ and you can feel immediately that you're with a group of people who know where they've come from and they know where they're going and they know why they're here. And you immediately feel like you're home. Now, I got to tell you, I, I just, on the way here, on, on the five-hour flight, we'll maybe talk a little bit about this later, but um, I just finished the, the manuscript on a book that will be coming out in October, and it's about Dallas and my conversations uh, as he was dying about heaven. And one of the things I realized just, and that, you know that's, that's fresh in my mind from from reading that over the, on, on the trip over. But one of the things I realized is I don't know that you know this, but this is a little right here. This is a little slice of heaven because there's not very many places that I go where I see so many different generations and so many different races and so many different ethnic groups from so many different parts of the world in one place, singing one song to one Savior. That is going to be a big part of what eternity is going to be like. This is just a little bit of a slice of heaven, and that's in large measure why I kind of feel like I'm home. Can I say thank you for that? This, you, okay, you're going to think I say this to everybody. I don't. You're, you're rare. You're rare. We're, we're trying to get places that, can, that are crossing boundaries of ethnic, race, age. It's not working so well, especially in L.A., I mean, if I could take a picture of this and hold it up to my classes and go, no, really, there was this place in, where am I? Lancaster. <laughs> what is it? Lexington. <laughs> That's famous for starting a war. <laughs> that we won. You got to like that. But. What, okay, so I got, I'll just a little segue here. I got my degree, my, my PhD in England, and I went to a, what, what we would call a, a revolutionary war museum. And so I said to the guy that was kind of walking around, um, so where, where is this part of the revolutionary war? And he goes, oh, we don't say the revolutionary war. We say the war of secession. And I go, well, we won. 
and it's the Revolutionary War. That's the way that goes. Yeah, succession. I mean, this, this is, so, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm a guy coming in, and I'm just looking at who you are, and I'm amazed. I'm sure you got your problems. <laughs> so thank you, you, you bless me. And, and that first song, you know what that is? That's the Sermon on the Mount. Really well done. And I've never seen a guy play a box. Well, <laughs> never seen a guy play a box poorly either. Never seen a guy play a box. But that, that's, that song is about the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is what Dallas wrote the Divine Conspiracy about. So, okay, I'm going to start now. <laughs> All of that was free. So let me tell you a little bit about um, the, the, the book, how the book, The Divine Conspiracy Continued, came about. And that will kind of lead us into what the divine conspiracy is. And then after I kind of tell you how the book came about and then what the divine conspiracy is, I can tell you how to continue this thing we call the divine conspiracy. And then we're going to open up for, for Q&A. But here's the deal. It's not just questions and answers, because I may not have an answer to your question, because I, but I may be able to comment on something. But I want to hear from you as well, so I want to hear your comments and also your corrections because I'm here to learn too. All right? So we're in this together. So I'm, my job is to kind of make the cracker and then you're supposed to put the cheese on it so that we, we, all learn, we all learn together. Okay? Can we make that deal? That nobody, there's no dumb question and that we're going to learn, and if I don't explain something well enough, you could say, you know, you really screwed that one up, and I think that's important, and I want that before I go home and can't remember it. And, and here's the other thing. I'm not here to sell books. In fact, I think, actually, my job is to tell you enough about the book so that you don't have to read it. Uh, <laughs> I think that's kind of how this goes. So, and that's totally okay, because I'm here to give you what it is that the Lord has for you tonight, Okay. All right, now I'm really going to start. So the book, uh, the book came about as a, as a consequence of Dallas and I um, working together uh, on my PhD dissertation. I met Dallas really young in life. I was, I was 23 years old. I was working in San Francisco, newly married, out of college, trying to figure out what it meant to be a Christian in a professional environment. And uh, a good friend of mine, is still a good friend of mine, who is our pastor there, uh, in this little church in, in uh, just north of San Francisco, invited Dallas to come to do this little weekend retreat. And he came, and he talked about, for, for th three or four sessions, about um, what eventually became the book, The Divine Conspiracy. And I remember, um, so I, I was raised Southern Baptist. In fact, you know, there's some debate as to whether I was actually born in a Southern Baptist nursery. I mean, I've been in the church kind of my whole life. And so when I was 23, 24 years old, and I heard Dallas come and talk about the divine conspiracy and really the nature of the gospel as Jesus describes it in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, for me, it, 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 it's really, I, I got to kind of try to grasp the poignancy of me thinking that I'd heard the gospel for the first time. For the first time in my life, I heard the good news, not just the bad news. I heard that I was saved to something, not just from something. That's the magic, the beauty, the wonder of life with God in eternity, eternal life. So I'm going to give you a couple of little like nuggets that I, if you're write, taking no, notes down, little nuggets that Dallas would give me that I want to give to you. Eternal life is not life after death. Eternal life in the scriptures is understood to be life without limit, which includes quantity 
and quality. It's not just life that doesn't, it's not bound by a time clock. Okay? It's not just timeless life. It's life without limit in both quantity and quality. And that eternal life is made available now. Right now. I didn't know that. It may have been preached where I was... You know, in my, in my time uh, before I met Dallas, but I didn't get it. And so when he revealed that Jesus preached the kingdom of, of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God, and not just a gospel of forgiveness of sin, vistas opened up for me and I felt like water was being poured onto a parched and dry soul. And so I remember driving home that first night after hearing Dallas talk, and I said to my wife, we were in her old 1966 Mustang and, and that I could never fix, and we got, anyway, that's another story. But so we're driving home, and, uh, and I, turned, I, I looked over to her and I said, you know, you know who that guy reminds me of? She says, no, who? And I said, Willy Wonka. Not the Johnny Depp, you know, not that version. That's, he's creepy. All the teeth stuff, what was that? All right? No, the old uh, Gene Wilder one, the good one, right? You know what? You millennials have screwed up Willy Wonka <laughs> and Star Trek. Bad. My, can I get an Amen. All right. So I said, you know, he reminds me of Willy Wonka. And she goes, Willy Wonka? Yeah. I said, he's like Willy standing in front of the kingdom of God, like his chocolate factory. And he's just opening it up and saying, whosoever will may come. It's like he was telling us all we had a golden ticket to all the wonders that were inside. So the next day I went to Dallas and I said, he was done and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, 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 you know, the retreat was over and I kind of waited in line and got up there and I was nervous and kind of starstruck and I don't know that I said anything coherent. And I, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 you really, uh, I just can't believe, and, you know, I mean that kind of stuff. And then I finally kind of got out, can I drive you to the airport? And I'm sure he's thinking, you can't talk, much less can you drive? I mean, so he goes, well, I've got a ride to the airport, but maybe we can have breakfast tomorrow morning. And so we had breakfast the next morning, and I kind of had got, you know, connected my brain to my mouth by that time. And, and we had a, a wonderful conversation about a lot of things. And he then said, you know, obviously you've got more questions than we have time to talk about here. Why don't, why don't we write letters? You remember what those are? Comes on a stamp, <laughs> post office, remember that? No. So we wrote letters back and forth for quite a while. And then after four or five years, I kind of got lost in my career. And I kind of forgot about the divine conspiracy. And I, 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 I got wrapped up in the, the systems of our world and the, and the thinking. And, I, and I, my heart began to get hard. And, and about 35, so about 10 years later... I entered into a really dark period of my life. I, I, was, I was in a, a career that was really doing very well, but at 35, I had accomplished what I thought it would take me till the age of 65 to accomplish. And I had achieved everything that I thought I wanted to achieve, and I, I wasn't satisfied. That's a tough day. That's a tough day at 35 years old to realize that your dreams aren't worthy of your life. And I, began to, I entered into a period of uh, pretty dark depression. And primarily the depression, it, it certainly was physical, emotional, mental, but um, it, it really started because I didn't get 
what I thought I was des- what I deserved in the next rung of my career. And I'm ashamed to say this, but it was true. At 35 years old, it was the first time in my life I didn't get something I really wanted. And I did not know this, but I was living a prosperity gospel. I was living a gospel that said, if I succeeded in whatever it was that I was endeavoring to do, right, that God was with me. Right? And I didn't get the yellow brick road ended for me. I didn't get the next thing on my list. And I got mad at God. But as a good Southern Baptist boy, I know God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life. So what do I do with this cognitive dissonance between I believe I have this prosperity gospel that God should be providing what it is. You know, He's behind me if I'm successful. But then, but I'm mad because I didn't get the next thing. And, and actually there was even, oh my, I know, hold on to your chairs, a little bit of injustice to it. For, at 35 is the first time I experienced injustice. That's how privileged I was. I was wronged. I didn't know what to do with that. So I got mad at God. Because he's working for me, right? That's what a prosperity gospel says. And so that, what you do when you've got anger and you don't know where to place it and it goes down, you swallow it. That's oftentimes what is the, the spark of depression. Rage turned inward. No place to go. So about 18 months, I was in this really dark place and I was sitting in my doctor's office ready to get my first prescription of my antidepressant. And on the table, on the coffee table, was a Christianity Today magazine. And then there was an article about Dallas and the divine conspiracy. And I read it. And there was this flood of hope, this ray of light. I remembered. I remembered. I remembered what the life with Christ was supposed to be like. And I ran out to my little Christian bookstore down the street and I bought the book and I tried to read it. (laughs) And it was hard. Okay, can I get an amen there? How many of you have tried to read The Divine Conspiracy? It's still on your nightstand. It's been written since 1997. Right? He used to say it's his most most often bought, least read book. (laughs) It's a cheesecake. You can't eat it all at once. You got to nibble at it. You got to marinate in it. And I did. And I read it once. And I read it twice. And I read it three times. And all of a sudden, I began to understand what it is that my life was about and the plan that God had for me. About three, four years later, I, with the help of some very good friends and, and good Christian counseling and, and the love of my family and friends, I, I kind of woke up to, I was almost grown up now. I was like 38 years old. I better figure out what it is I want to do with my life. And I realized it, I didn't really want to be in the industry that I was in. What I really wanted to do for the rest of my days, the thing that made just every, when I looked down that road, I just saw nothing but joy and hope and and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and fulfillment. I wanted to pursue with everything I had the nature of life in the kingdom of God. And I also recognized that I had been given in my corporate experience a tremendous amount of leadership training and experience. And I saw that many of our churches struggle with both of those things. The ability to actually have the kind of courageous, effective leadership that so many of our other for-profit kind of companies and non-for-profit companies have. But, but if, if, they, if they have a grasp on the mission, they're missing the, the ability to do that mission effectively or they're missing the mission, right? But they have the effectiveness. No, we've got to put the, the mission and the ability to get the mission together. 
And I saw that God, despite myself, had prepared me for that kind of calling. And so I retired from my firm, and my wife and I decided that we would go to seminary, and we went to seminary, and one of the things I realized in seminary is part of the reason why pastors don't have a good understanding of the nature of the gospel is because none of Dallas's teachings are actually in the seminary. Very few. I did a survey of many of the seminaries in our country, and very few of them actually have any of Dallas's writings or work uh, as core texts. So after seminary, I, 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 uh, during seminary, I had kind of reconnected with Dallas, but after seminary, I said, you know what, Dallas, I think there's an opportunity for me to um, do some scholarship and, and actually organize your theology in such a way that it can be brought into the academy. And if it can be brought into the academy, then it can be taught. And then pastors can actually get into some of their core teaching when they come to seminary. I said, what do you think about that? And he says, I, th I think that's exactly what we need to do. So I spent three years with Dallas organizing and going through his, all of his corpus of all of his writings and all of his uh, talks. There were these things called cassette tapes. Stacks of them. You know what those are? It's like before discs and downloads. They came in this little reel-to-reel -reel thing. I actually had to go out and buy, they're expensive now, a Sony Walkman. Because of all the, you know, of all the, and then somebody told me later I could have transferred into a MIM T3 and that really made me mad. But, <laughs> so, so I, I went through his, his entire corpus and you know, wrote my dissertation on his theology and organized it. So, um, and one of the reasons why I went to the UK to do that is because I wanted to study American evangelicalism outside of American evangelicalism. And that's really important for what we're going to talk about a little bit later. So I went away. I got the ability to kind of look at it a little bit more objectively than I think I would have if I'd have stayed here. A lot of good schools here, that not, you know, but, but I, I really wanted to, 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 to intentionally uh, try to get that level of objectivity th I if I could. And so we, we came back, and I finished my dissertation, and Dallas and Jane, his wife, and my wife Susie and I all went out to dinner uh, to his favorite steak place, and I presented him the the... the it's like a phone book. It's, it's just, it, nobody's ever going to read it, but it's just a big, huge kind of doorstop thing. You know, I set it down and, and we celebrated, you know, finishing this dissertation. And it was a great night. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that. It was a great night of Thanksgiving and praise to all that God had done in my life and his life. I mean, it was just, it was wonderful. And during that dinner, I said to him, kind of an off the cuff comment, there's a lot of stuff that I've found in all of your writings and speaking that is a, a complement to the divine conspiracy that you've never written about anywhere. I think you've got another book. And he goes, really? He goes, well, why don't you write down a few ideas about what um, some chapter titles or subjects that you think would be a good book and, and send them to me. And so I did. And um, about two months later, he called me and said, hey, I, I really like your suggestions. I think, I, I think there is another book there. And I said, good. And he said, and I want you to write it with me. Uh, I still... Uh, I don't have the words to describe that. Just absolute grace, joy, gift. Just a gift. Nothing I had done in my life had put me in a position to deserve that. Just plain grace. And so we started. And he had, he'd, he had begun to, to suffer uh, from the effects of cancer, but we were hopeful. He had had a pretty invasive procedure, um, and we were hopeful that he, would, he had a year or years left. Um, he went through all of his chemo, and we were hopeful. And we we started really in January of 2012, um, and he was pretty energetic. I mean, he, he had his radiation treatment sometimes, but or his chemo treatment sometimes, and that would he would get, you know, weak. But then a couple of days later, he'd get his energy back, and 
there was, it was really, we were, we were really all hopeful and the doctors were hopeful. And, and so, um, I would, he lived about 70 miles from me and, and I would drive over three, four days a week and we would work on the book. And I was just, I, you know, I, it was, it was awesome. It was wonderful. It was so much fun. And then he got sicker. And um, he ended up dying. And I was, had the great honor to be with him, the, the only person in the room with him when he died. I would spend the nights with him, and Jane and the family would be there during the day. And we were working to finish this book. And we were also working on really cataloging what he thought was really most important for me to know about his understanding of what heaven was like. So we were working on these two things kind of together. And, um, and I was able to watch him enter into eternity. One of the most sacred times of my life. I think that some of the most sacred times in life are watching, being there when life comes into the world and being there when life leaves. Just absolutely holy holy moments in life. We often run from the second. We can't. It's just as holy. So, what's the divine conspiracy? What's the divine conspiracy? The divine conspiracy is God's plan, His mission, His intention to overwhelm the kingdoms of this world not with evil, but with good. That's the divine conspiracy. And Dallas talks about it's an inverted conspiracy. It's not the strong with the weak. It's not the first, but the last. It's an upside down kingdom. It sneaks up on you. It doesn't use the power systems of this world. It's counterintuitive. It's ironic. It sneaks up on you doesn't come as a conquering hero on a white horse. He comes as a baby. He doesn't demolish the kingdoms of this world with a sword. He demolishes the stronghold of this world on a cross. It's an inverted kingdom. So God's plan to overwhelm, God's divine conspiracy is to overwhelm the kingdoms of this world, which includes your kingdom and mine. Your kingdom is where you reign, where what you want done is done. God's kingdom is where what God wants done is done. You have a kingdom. I have a kingdom. And God's objective is to overwhelm your kingdom and mine and all the systems of the world when kingdoms collide the kingdoms of humanity, when they coalesce, is to overwhelm them, not with evil, but with good. The strongest power in the universe, the strongest power in the universe is agape love. And God is using that to overwhelm evil. So, what Dallas does in Divine Conspiracy is he describes how that plays out in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So I'll let you read that because that's a pretty easy part of the book to, to understand. Here's where it gets a little bit sticky. What he then does is he then says, this is where Western or American versions of evangelicalism have missed the boat. And he describes this thing called the sin management gospel. The sin management gospel. So, the sin management gospels come in three forms. He mentions two in the book, but later in his life he, can't, he recognized that there was a third. The first one is the gospel of the right. And you could, you could say conservative right if you wanted to, the, the conservative Christianity. Conservative Christianity in America is primarily concerned with right belief, accurate belief, correct dogma, doctrine. So how does this work? 
So overwhelmingly in my classes, I teach at Azusa Pacific. It's a conser- kind of a conservative. Some, some say it's too conservative. Some say it's not conservative enough. Somebody would say you're in California. It's impossible for you to be conservative. Um, <laughs> but uh, most of my students, is, if I say, how do you know you're a Christian? They're going to almost instinctively give me some version of the Apostles' Creed. I believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I believe that He came to atone for my sin. I believe that He died on the cross for for atonement. I believe that He rose on the third day. I believe that He forgave my sins, and if I trust my, put my faith in Him, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's the Apostles' Creed. That's right belief. My life doesn't need to actually necessarily be affected by those facts. But as long as I've got right belief, I'm good. The gospel of the left is right action. So so we're going to spend a lot of time digging wells in Africa. We're going to spend a lot of time uh, feeding the hungry and and clothing the naked and building houses for the the homeless and um, doing a lot of... uh, of of important work, humanitarian work, right? I may not love anybody. I may be doing that all through gritted teeth. But I'm doing right action. That's the gospel of the left. Gospel of the right is right belief. Gospel of the left is right action. There's a third one, which is newer, which is the gospel of the church which says, if I take care of the church, the church is going to take care of me. If I belong to a group of people that are doing good things, and quite frankly, this is a little bit more, I don't know, are the young people over here? Because I think you are, because I'm pointing every time I say something kind of whimsical about you, I think you're over there. So here it comes, right? <laughs> this is a little bit more their territory right now because it, you know it's all about community. Got to belong. Got to belong, right? It's all about community. That's this kind of, if, if, if somehow the gospel is going to seep into me if I belong to this community. And so Dallas would say, all, each one of these, there's, there's, there's truths in them. That's what makes them so dangerous. If, if they were easy to just completely discount, it would, they wouldn't have any power. It's, that, it's not that each one of them or any of them are wrong in and of themselves. It's that each one of them belongs, they're exclusionary to the other. Right? And what that turns into is what we call barcode Christianity. You know what a barcode is, right? It's that those lines on the back of a, whatever, I'm looking for something somebody's got with a barcode. You know the scanner? The barcode. You all know what I'm talking about, right? There you go. Hold that up. All right, the barcode on the back of that. Now, let's just imagine that that barcode is on a box of Wheaties. Okay? Do you know what Wheaties are? <laughs> so, <laughs> Captain Crunch, you know what that is? <laughs> My kids don't eat that stuff anymore, so I don't know what's new. Huh? Yeah. So, All the scanner knows is what it says on the box. You could have dog food in the box. The scanner wouldn't know. It's going to just, when you go across the scanner, it's going to say Wheaties. It could be Alpo. The scanner only knows what's on the outside of the box. So barcode Christianity is, if my scanner says, I've got right beliefs, or if my scanner says, I've got right action. Or if my scanner says, I belong to the right church, you're in. That's barcode Christianity. And what the divine conspiracy says is, God is not dumb enough to create that kind of system. (laughs) Nobody's going to fool him. So why try? And so the divine conspiracy, the the first book, tries to explain to Christians what has become so familiar, it became unfamiliar. And with unfamiliarity, oftentimes unfamiliarity breeds contempt. 
And so he called American evangelical churches back to the gospel. And so my thesis on his theology, what I called it is a proto-evangelical faith. What that means is, I believe that Dallas was arguing for the original, the prototype, the gospel Jesus preached. And there are people today who will tell you that it is an impossibility for you to engage the gospel Jesus preached. You're too far away. 2,000 years is too far away. You're not in first century Palestine. You are bound by your context. You are bound by your language. You are bound by your imagination. You cannot enter the world that Jesus is articulating or Paul is articulating in the New Testament because your context has, has imprisoned you. Men and women, that's a post modern lie that you need a lot of education to believe. That's the miracle of revelation. God has the ability to speak and cut through it all. Cut through it all. 2,000 years of history, 2,000 years of culture, 2,000 years of philosophy, 2,000 years of ideology, 2,000 years of political intrigue and, and power brokering. Cut through it all and give you the truth. Truth is not in jeopardy. Our belief in truth is. And so Dallas would say there is a proto-evangelical faith that we can hear and see and taste and know. No. Now, let me explain what that means. I've never sat on that stool. I don't know it'll hold me up. I believe, based upon what I see, that it'll hold me up. But I don't know. I have a friend who says he believes that air travel is the safest way to travel. He won't get on a plane. He doesn't really believe. He professes belief. There's a difference. Little nugget. We always act up to the level of our true beliefs. You want to know if you really believe something? How do you act? Do you act like what you say you believe is true? is actually the case. So, I profess belief in the stool. You don't know if I really believe it. Here we go. (laughs) The skeptic. (laughs) Belief is gone. I now know. Don't I? I'm actually sitting in the reality of my knowledge. I am accurately able to represent what's going on on an appropriate basis of both thought and experience. I have knowledge. I don't know everything there is to know about this stool, but I know the stool will hold me up. Now, the next time I come to the stool, I'm not going to believe in it because I have knowledge of it. Now I have faith. Knowledge projected into the future is what the Bible describes as faith. Faith of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what they're saying. When the Israelites walk out of the desert after 40 years, what do they say? What does God tell them? You go to that river Jordan and you take out rocks and you put those rocks in an altar on the shoreline and what? You tell your kids, this day the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob led you out of the desert and to the promised land. Why? Because that's a fact. And that fact is based on knowledge. And that knowledge will lead them in faith that God will deal with them just like he dealt with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the future. So people, it's time that we stop professing belief and it's time that we know what we're talking about. That's the divine conspiracy. 
The divine conspiracy continued is very a very simple continuation of that idea. It's basically, now you know I'm a, I'm a theology professor because I'm going to trot out Greek on you. Okay? It's based on one idea, one word. Anybody want to try that? Chickens. Dikaiosune. Dikaiosune. It's a Greek word that's translated in the Bible, righteousness. Doesn't quite get what it is that Greek is really trying to do. So we have to add words in English. That's one of the great reasons why Greek is what it is. It's like love, right? Greek's got a lot of words for love because there's more expressions of that idea than just the one word. The kaiosune is the ability to both know and do the right thing. Sometimes it's translated in Aristotle and Plato's writings, virtue. Mm. Better, better definition is the ability to both know no, did I say believe? I didn't. No and do the right thing. That requires knowledge of the good and the courage and character to do the right thing. What we're arguing in the divine conspiracy continued is discipleship to Jesus. Being a student and apprentice of Jesus, I'm learning to live my life as Jesus would live it if he were me. That's not WWJD. Now, I'm not against WWJD. I read Charles Sheldon book when I was 16 years old, and it was a, f- a phenomenon to me to think about that. But I'm not a first century rabbi, celibate, walking the earth. That's not who I am. I got a wife, and I got kids, and I got a mortgage, and I got a job, and I got a neighbor with a yappy dog. I got a life. Discipleship to Jesus means that I'm living my life in my context, where I am, with my friends, where I'm at, as Jesus would live it if he was living next to my yappy dog, which is a part of my spiritual formation, I tell you not. (laughs) You need to cut that out. That can't go on YouTube. Actually, I've got several neighbors, so maybe they don't know which one I'm talking about. I don't know which one I, I'm talking about because I don't want to know because I'm afraid of what I would do if I knew whose it was. <laughs> it's tough to be a rider with a yappy dog in the neighborhood. I know. Oh, and you went to Hawaii. You know, I'm just, yeah. Injustice reigns all around me, right? It's unfair. <laughs> yappy dogs. All right. So I, that, I'm trying to live my life where I'm at in my context the way Jesus would do it. Now, one of the things that we are really not good at in the church is helping you imagine that Jesus could be a bank teller. Jesus could absolutely be a bank teller. He could absolutely be a small business owner. He could have absolutely been a, an elementary school teacher, a college professor, Absolutely. He absolutely could have been a soccer coach. Absolutely. And one of the reasons why we we have this thing called uh, the myth of the sacred-secular divide is because so many of us can't imagine doing anything that is worthy unless we're doing Jesus-like stuff, which makes it look like that we have to be a pastor to be like Jesus. That's not the goal. No. See, our churches have a tendency to be wrapped around this idea like a single-setting restaurant. Have you ever been to a single-setting restaurant? It's like you, you get one menu, one, you know, one uh, plate. It's not called a plate. Entree. Yeah, we're serving duck. You don't like duck? Go someplace else. That's what we're doing tonight. We're doing duck. It's like a single ser- serving restaurant. Every week you come in and you've got an amazing cook that serves you up a really nice meal and everybody comes and it's all really good and well. And in fact, it's so good, you, you, you maybe order a little bit more so you can take it home and lunch and a sack on it and a doggy bag on Wednesdays, right? And then you go home and you try to make it until the next Sunday. That's not Jesus' idea. His idea was not to have one behemoth organization. 
Jesus' idea and Paul's idea in the New Testament was not that he would have one big behemoth celebrity chef in one restaurant. The idea was to make a cooking school. That instead of walking in, you don't get a menu, you get a knife. And you learn to chop. And you learn to bake. And you learn to mix. And then, once you're trained how to break, bake the bread of life, you open a little cafe in your neighborhood. You open a little, a little taco stand in the boardroom of your company where you're feeding people the, the, the beautiful, wondrous, eternal, living bread of life. That's the church. So here's the deal. Paul says, the whole earth groans, waiting for the sons and daughters, the children of God, to be revealed. They groan. You, know, you see this. I see it. It's inescapable, the groaning. It, it's gotten to the point now where we've almost got to cover our ears. It's so loud. It's so heartbreaking. I'm tempted to do that sometimes. The whole earth is groaning. Why is the earth groaning? Because they're waiting for the goodness of, and graciousness and power of people of the Kaiosune to infect every arena of our world, to be lights in dark places, to be a city on a hill that cannot be hid. So we are looking for people, not within the walls of the church, but to cascade outside the walls of the church, to go in every arena of society, to go into business, to go into education, to go into law, to go into medicine, and be salt and light there. The place where you're going to learn how to become people who know and do the right thing, there's only one place on the planet where that happens. There was a time where the legal system, the justice system, was primarily concerned with justice. There was a time when the medical system was primarily concerned with holistic well-being. There was a time when the educational system was primarily concerned with knowledge and truth. There was a time when the political system was primarily concerned with the common good. No longer. But there is still a time, men and women, brothers and sisters, where the church of Jesus Christ is devoted to hope, pace, faith, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, forgiveness, mercy, truth, life, love. If you don't do it, if you here in this group, in the church, if you're not devoted to making the people of the Kaiosune followers of Jesus who are living your life as he would live it if he were you in your life, job, in your families, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. There's only one place in the world that can make a disciple. One. And that's his church. That's his body. Dallas used to say over and over again, the church, the church is for discipleship. And disciples are for the world. So they may taste and see that the Lord is good. That they may look at your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Nobody should ever wonder why we're Christians. I've been in several meetings over my career where we would say something like, you know who we need for this, this job? We need a good Mormon. They have a reputation for being honest, family people, work hard, devoted. They have that reputation. You know what we should be saying in every arena of society? We need more of those Christ followers. I want more of them on my neighborhood. I want more of them in my company. I want more of them in my school system. The whole earth groans. 
waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. The church is here to make disciples. And disciples are for the world. And the book, very simply, talks about how the kingdom will come in every arena of society. And we talk about some key leadership positions. We talk about it, what it would look like in politics and in law and in medicine and in uh, business and in education. Because you know what? You know what? I'm all in. I'm done playing. It's time. I'm sorry. I really am. I repent for the fact that I waited so long that I was willing to trade my birthright for a bowl of soup. But I've been redeemed from that idea and I'm all in. And the world needs us. Dallas used to say, yes, it is true that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But it's also true that God loved the world so much he gave the world you. That's what we're trying to do in the book. We're trying to live in the kingdom. We're trying to express its reality. We're trying to be salt and light. And we stumble and fall and we don't do it perfectly. But man, oh man, we're all in. No turning back. Remember that? I have decided follow Jesus. And you know what happens when you do that? I don't believe in Jesus anymore. I know him. I don't know everything there is to know about him. But I know him. And he knows me. And I'd have it no other way. That's the book. That's the prayer. That's the hope. Am I done? I think I'm done. I think I'm, I think I'm actually on time. I'm hardly ever on time. My students would absolutely say that. I'm, I'm called No Break Black because in, in, we, we have three, hour, three and a half hour classes. Wow. Once a week, right? And sometimes I forget to take a break. Well, we're going to take a break just <laughs> right now for two minutes here. Let uh, No Break Black catch his breath. And we'll do a couple Q&A. But while we just take just a, a quick break, I just, the, the break is this. Just to talk with a couple people at your table and just, and just share what the most important insight that you just heard was here tonight. Okay, so far. And then we'll do some Q&A and we'll take some questions here uh, from you guys in the crowd. So take a couple moments to do that and uh, we'll jump right back in here with some uh, questions. All right, let's uh, circle back. And I was uh, thinking about this chance to get to talk with Gary and ask him some questions. And uh, I wrote down a lot, but I'll just maybe ask you a, a few here, sure. kind of pertaining a little bit to Dallas and, you know, maybe your relationship and a little bit of uh, things about him that, you know, you got to experience firsthand that probably a lot of us would be interested just to kind of know about. Then a little bit more of maybe some of his thoughts and then getting into the nuts and bolts a little bit about how do we actually live out this divine conspiracy in kind of day-to-day -day life. So I always appreciated a lot of Dallas's great one-liners. Like he, he met his wife when uh, they were in college and in the college library, and he used to say, I, you know, I checked her out and I never checked her back in. And uh, <laughs> he had so many, so many great lines like that. And uh, Kind of geeky, intelligent one-liners. Yeah, yeah, they were. They were, made you think. Around was, the library. I know. <laughs> And so Dallas had such a warm, you know, warm humor about him as you uh, hear about some of his interactions, even with the faculty and things at uh, the University of Southern California, and we taught for so many years. Um, there was just such a respect that people had for him. And I remember, I think, hearing Richard Foster talk about one time they were having lunch together and walking through, and Dallas was just touching, you know, getting the kind of touch, touch base with each different faculty member about what's going on with their life. And, and there's something about him while he was warm and, you know, kind, uh, but 
this aspect as well where they were talking about how he just had this great gentleness about him that was such a draw. And then the latest book even here that his daughter compiled, The Allure of Gentleness, talks about how we can defend the faith in the manner of Jesus and witness with this allure of gentleness. And my other favorite writer I quote a lot is Eugene Peterson. On the back of the, the book, he endorses it. And he says, Dallas was unfailingly gentle and respectful. Um, can you talk about it, some of that? And then also I remember hearing at Dallas's, uh the memorial service, they said, well, Dallas was so gentle and loving and kind toward everyone, he wouldn't allow himself to be bullied either. Yeah, no. Could you talk a little bit about that tension sure. of being alluringly gentle, but then also not allowing yourself to be a doormat or be bullied as you witnessed in his life? Well, it's not, it's not loving to allow people to bully you. So you're not loving them if, if you allow that to occur. Um, so sometimes we get a little bit confused about, you know, what love is, what, what agape, the agape form of love is. And, and Dallas would always say agape love is seeking the highest good for the other. So we would say, people say they love chocolate cake. They don't. They want to eat it. <laughs> and it's not in the best interest of the cake. And then he would say, now think about that in relation to your marriage. And people would go, whoa. So they'd laugh. <laughs> and then they'd, ooh. <laughs> right? So being bully, allowing someone to bully you, we can, it's, and, and sometimes it, it, it really is. I mean, so much of our Christian faith, confide, confidence. Confide is Latin for with faith. So much of our confidence in walking with Jesus is this internal motivation that we have to know what it is we're endeavoring to do and why. Others may not. So when you try to stop someone from bullying you, you can be perceived as standing up for your rights. Dallas never did that. I'm not saying that that's wrong. Okay? Because oftentimes, someone degrading you is not good for you or them. But he would always try to think about what is in the best interest of the other. It's not in their best interest to be allowed to continue to think that that kind of behavior is acceptable. You're not going to do that to me. I love you too much. And that's a completely different posture than I deserve better. That sounds like I love myself so much that, which is true, we want to do that. But you see the difference, right? Fighting for my own rights as opposed to trying to do what's in the best interest of the other. So that's part of that, that bullying thing that he, he wouldn't want to do. But Dallas's gentleness was epic. Um, I write in the introduction to the book that one of the things that was so alluring to me about, G, about uh, Jesus in Dallas was the authenticity. And I, I write that sometimes... I would, have, I would be with Dallas, especially in the earlier years. And it was as if he reminisced about Jesus. As if just a minute or two, just moments before he had come to be with me, he'd been with Jesus. Like the disciples had been on the Sea of Galilee. And it was as if it was so real, I could still smell the fish. And, and the, the, the smell of Galilee on his clothes and hands. And it was, it was that experience that allowed me to begin to believe that I could know Jesus like that. I mean, I really could know and interact with Jesus like that. And now I just, I, you know... I'm probably too Pentecostal for non-Pentecostals and not Pentecostal for 
not Pentecostal enough for Pentecostals. But I, I Dallas helped me to watch and be mentored by an individual who literally had a walking, living, ongoing conversation with Jesus. And it was as if the disciples didn't have anything on him. I mean, I think we have a tendency to think, well, I just really, you know, I, I'm really at a disadvantage because Jesus didn't walk with me and I didn't get to shake his hand and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Dallas didn't live like that. And people would say, I think I heard John Ortberg share one time that, you know, I want to live in Dallas's time zone. You know, he, he just lived in a whole different way as if he was actually living that above kind of life here and below. Could you talk about maybe what were some of the core spiritual practices and disciplines of his kind of daily life that enabled him to, to live that out, to be that kind of salt and light in a very secular environment uh, at USC and kind of bridge that secular sacred divide, which is a lot of what you guys talk about in the book? Yeah. Well, Dallas... Dallas was a certain kind of person. So he was an introvert, and he was an intellectual, and he was shy. And so the spiritual disciplines that Dallas engaged, he would never want to prescribe to everybody, because everybody's not an intellectual, introvert, you know, USC professor of philosophy, epistemologist, phenomenologist, you know, author, speaker, you know, world intellectual. So... So he would also he would always say, if a if a spiritual discipline is easy for you to do, you probably shouldn't you do it. So for 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 him, you probably should not do should, it. You shouldn't. You probably shouldn't do it. I mean, so I play golf, uh, kinda, and <laughs> I I'm, I can hit the ball in the fairway with my driver. I don't like the. I, I'm not a very good putter. What should I work on? Right? So if I'm really good, and I, I, I know you don't believe this, I'm, a, I'm somewhat of an introvert. right? So I, when I go to a monastery three days alone, no yappy dogs, I'm so happy. And I come home refreshed, and, I, and then I enter the house, and you know, the, kind of the first thing, my two daughters are arguing in the morning about who's going to go to the bathroom first, and then my wife's talking to me about... The guy that does our lawn ran over three new sprinkler heads and the water's going everywhere and we're in a drought. And then all the problems of the world come in and I go, "Eh, what happened? I want to go back to the monastery. I don't do that so well. I need to practice that. That's my putting. Right? I need to be around people. Dallas used to say this funny thing too. He would say... "Um, if, if Jesus told you, and he did, as he did, he taught us to love our enemies. He said, I don't know of a better reason why to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> you might find a few enemies there that you should love. That's great. That becomes a discipline for me, especially when I write things that people don't approve of or they don't like, or they think I'm wrong. And I, I, need, to, I, need, I, need, to, I need to practice that putt. Yeah. That's great. Now, I'm, I'm really excited to hear about the, the new book, and I remember you know, Dallas said that, quoting Jesus, that those who follow him will never taste death. And he said, when you actually pass away, it might be a long time till you actually realize that you're dead. And some while. Some while. Some while. It may be some while before some you while. figure it. Yeah. So I think Dallas. Long time is a very deep philosophical question for Dallas. So some while. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, it's so, okay. It doesn't so, really matter so, to anybody but me. But I was yes. trying. I was trying to get to the punchline. Was do you think Dallas knows he's dead yet? I think he. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think he's. Yeah. I. I. I do. And uh, he talks about so heaven. You know, he would yeah. say, um, "God will let anyone into heaven who can stand it." Who can possibly stand it? Possibly stand it. Yes. Talk about that. Well, so in in a large measure, this is what we were talking about, kind of at the at the end of his life, uh, regarding some of the things that really prevent us from making this decision to go all in, as I've said. Okay. And so we were we were talking. I'll, I'll describe this for you. 
we were sitting at his kitchen table and he took out a pen on a napkin or, or a, a paper towel and he drew a circle and he, he didn't really mean to, but he drew, he drew kind of what looks like a yin-yang thing. That, don't get lost in that. <laughs> and he says, so let's assume that when we die, this is our soul. Now for Dallas, the soul was the whole life. Okay, it's not an p- aspect of our life, it's our whole life. It was the Hebrew concept of nefesh, the whole life. So all your actions, your thoughts, your relationships, everything and everything that you are, if you want to get a deeper understanding of this, it's in the book, The Renovation of the Heart, okay? which is Dallas's anthropology, what he thinks about who we are as, as human beings. He says, let's say this is the soul when we die. And he said, let's assume that this person... I think the worst thing he could think of anybody was that they were a heroin addict. He said, "Let's." Yeah, I don't even know. If, is, is that? I don't even know if that's still like a big deal. Is it heroin? Or, so, is it? I think it's still a serious is, is issue. Is it a big yeah, deal? I'm pretty sure. See, what do yeah. I know? All right. Yeah. Like maybe like a Yankees fan. You know, a like big a fan. Yankees fan. <laughs> so here's a Yankees fan in heaven. You really have to cut that out. (laughs) This is Derek Jeter's soul. (laughs) Bucky Dent. Oh, yeah, okay. There's a few old timers that remember that. Okay. So, it's not Bill Buckner's soul, though. Okay, I'll quit. I'll leave it alone. So, um, so... This part of their life, this part of their soul, has been really devoted to darkness, let's just say. And all of the things that demand that they compromise on what is good and right and pure and whole and true in order to feed that addiction. And it doesn't have to be an addiction. It could be other things. But it was just an example, okay? Don't, don't think that we're just camping on addiction or addicts, okay? That, that's not what we're doing. We're just, it's, it's just an example. This could be, any, this could be anything. This could be... Any sin that really begins to overwhelm a good section of our life, and we devote ourselves to it, okay? That's an addiction. It doesn't have to be to a substance, right? And so the, the, the myth that we have in many forms of Christianity is that when we die, God is just going to cut this out, right? Because no sin enters into heaven. And what we do is we go through what he called is this cosmic car wash. Warsh. Wash. I'm from western Pennsylvania, so we say warsh. I okay. get you. I'm following you. And what you end up with is this perfected self. There's no evidence in Scripture for that. None. So what Dallas does as a phenomenologist and a philosopher is to suggest that If we enter into heaven as human beings, which there's no indication that we don't continue life and eternity as human beings, what it means to be human means something. And part of what it means to be human is to have will. That's what separates us from the animals. We have the ability to choose. We have freedom of will. Now, if you're a Calvinist or a Lutheran, we'll talk about that later. But... We have will. And there's nothing to suggest that we won't continue to have will into eternity. So the problem then becomes, if we don't choose today to allow Christ, the light and truth and hope of Christ, to invade those aspects of our character, why would we assume that God would overwhelm our will in heaven if that's not what we want now? So what Dallas and I are arguing from Scripture, and I don't have time to pull out all the biblical justification for this, but we do make an argument from Scripture that what happens is we enter into eternity like that. The, the, it's, right? This is removed. Sin is gone, separated from as as the east is from the west. But we don't enter into heaven complete. 
what we do is we spend the rest of eternity with Jesus learning how to trust Him and to live our lives. And we grow. And one of the reasons why this is, again, hard for people to, recon uh, to reconcile with is because they've confused two words. There's a difference between perfect and complete. So a little acorn shoot can be perfect, but it's not complete. We can be perfect in heaven and not done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So those areas of our lives where we did not trust, where we did not have faith, where we did not believe, where we did not know, and we were consumed with fear and pride and shame and ignorance, we will enter into heaven with the opportunity to walk with Jesus and allow his truth and light to invade that part of our lives so that we willingly become those kinds of people who choose that reality so we grow into eternity which makes perfect sense right if you think about it because otherwise all of those unborn babies or infants or what are they just up there not hardly conscious of anything because they've never lived right experienced this life? Do they not grow? Do they not mature? None of us would say that that would be the way God continues to, to form his universe. And scripture com describes this growing process. So why is this important? Because we have developed this idea that all I need to do is hang on by my fingernails and manage my sin until I die, and then I'm going to go through that car wash, and God is going to impute on me the character that I never chose to begin with. And to be honest with you, I don't know exactly how he would do that. He would have to choose to give you something that never existed and that you never chose. And if he's going to override the will then, why doesn't he do it now and save us the trouble? That's not his plan. He knows human existence driven by love requires a choice because our characters and our personalities are driven primarily by the things we choose. That is a huge deterrent to discipleship. This idea that I'm just going to hang on till I die. Miserable. And I describe this in, in the book regarding my grandmother. My grandmother was a, a religious woman so deeply re in the worst sense of the word. And she wanted to die decades before she did. Professing belief in all of the things that you would want and think that she should and never experiencing the joy, the peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control of the life of Jesus. And so I use her as an example in the book of the kind of life, the kind of religious life that doesn't breed joy and happiness and, and grace and power, that heaven is going to require. So that's why Dallas would say, the fires of heaven are twice as hot as the fires of hell. Because the grace and peace and patience of God is inescapable. And if you have spent your life trying to avoid that, you are going to be miserable. Because it's going to be inescapable. It's time. It, it's time to, 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 to get rid of the sins that so easily ensnare us. And this is what Dallas was recognizing in his final days. And that those, those, he was ready to walk into eternity without fear. So we talk a little, just a little bit about, can you imagine what life would be like if we weren't petrified of dying? 
You know how much of our, of, of our health care costs is spent in the last 90 days of, li- of life? You know, you know what that means when I said last 90 days? It didn't really work. <laughs> it wasn't 91. Now, I'm, look, I know helping people, the pain, the suffering, of all. I, I, I get all that. But think about all the time, effort, and energy that we put into preserving this life because, buddy, the majority of us are banking that this is it. It ain't it. The whole earth groans waiting for us to demonstrate that reality. I love how you guys write in the You don't have time yeah. for my answers. I have time for your questions. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's well said. Um, I just love, just to summarize, notice we have about 10 minutes left. I want to have a couple questions just from the, from the audience here. But uh, this kind of all just summarized well on the idea of how you guys define the Hebrew word shalom, you know, of peace. We used to describe it as a life marked without either fear or of want. That fear is the absence of shalom that God desires for us to, to have. And ultimately, God's perfect love is what casts out that fear. So I can imagine now if we would be living more, more like heaven, bringing God's kingdom here, and you know, having this world be more like heaven and less like hell, if we allowed God's love truly to free us from the fears that are gripping us, and wouldn't that be touchdown. such... That's such, the touchdown. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's the divine conspiracy. So what were the fears that maybe the Lord would want to cast aside from your own life, allow his love to penetrate those deepest parts of your heart? Because imagine being a kind of person who didn't live with fear like every other person, it seems like, in our world does. How freer we would, how much freer we would be without that fear. And I think that is a huge way that we can help continue this divine conspiracy in the workplace and in, uh, in our homes and in our world. So let's just take a couple questions. Uh, Pastor Richard has a little roaming microphone here. And uh, just throw a hand up if you have. We'll just maybe take time for just a couple questions and we'll wrap things now up here's here. here's the deal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here as long. I mean, you can leave. But if you don't get your question answered in the time we have left, I'm going to be up here and I'll stay as long as you guys have questions. So don't feel like you got to rush in or you got to go home and you didn't get your question answered. Okay, so I'm here for you. So don't, if you don't feel like answer, asking a question from all these people, you can come up later. I'll be here, okay? And I have to take him back to this hotel, so keep it kind of short. I'm just teasing. <laughs> uh, that short, short question. So I, I uh, think I understood your, your definition of heaven, but what's your definition of hell then? Other, Dallas, than, other than the opposite of heaven. Yeah, Dallas would say hell is the best that God can do for some people. Primarily, they get what they want. That's the sad part of it. That's why you don't have to wait to experience hell today. Neither do you have to wait to experience heaven. Hell is the absence of God. It's the absence of agape. It's here. It's just escapable here. Heaven is here too. Unfortunately, it's escapable as well. I think we have a pretty good idea what hell is. And and that should motivate us. And I'm not talking about just the biblical descriptions of hell. I, I mean, you've been to places, I've been to places where hell reigns. I bet you could drive five, six, eight miles, ten miles from here, you could probably find a neighborhood or, or, a, or a house where hell is raining right now. Probably a five iron from right here. I mean, the way I hit it. And we know what hell is. And I think it's time we really get an understanding of what heaven's like. And that's why I try to explain a little bit about what I do. I experienced right here. You get these windows where the wind of heaven blows across your soul. And you got to pay attention to that. Great answer. Others? Wow, all the way. 
I know. Go, Richard. Go, Richard. Come on. <laughs> he looks like Monty Hall running from... Yeah, I don't remember that at all. Either. Thank you very much. What's behind number three? Yes, I had a question. Um, well, what would you think about a fourth type of Christian? I call it the revolutionary Christian. Um, what it is it's like the same energy that we put into fighting against the Vietnam War and the same energy that I put into fighting equal rights for disabled people, that um, people would use that same energy to tell the world about the love of Jesus and how he cares for every one of us because even sometimes the pastors, they don't want to get involved in the disability rights movement because it's like it's safer like to be quiet yeah. than um, to join in my campaign. So that's what I want to know is what do you think about we all should join a revolution, tell the whole world about Jesus, not just stay here at grace. I'm with you. The, the, the funny thing, and we, we talk about this in the book, we talk about that um, we can't stay out of politics because we're in politics, because we're the polis. It's us. So if our political system is messed up, it's because, especially in a democratic system, it's because we're messed up. So we got to take ownership for that. And I, I, I think it's um, cru crucial that we have people of the Kaiosune who both know and can do the right thing in our political system, absolutely unequivocally. Here's the problem I think that we've often gotten into. We have a tendency to be idealist, uh, ideologues and, and get behind a cause or a candidacy as opposed to for fighting for what is right and good and best. And that, need, that I think, needs to be... The, the whole earth should recognize that the good that we bring, in the end, it, the proof's in the pudding. The whole earth should thrive because of that. I mean, that was the whole point of Israel, that God would have this people that would obey him. And when they obeyed him, they would thrive, and the whole world would go, what are they doing? What is that about? Well, they've got this funny thing about washing a lot, but they don't get sick. Huh. That's before we understand about germs. Viruses. God knew about germs and viruses. People didn't know about germs and viruses, but he told the Jews to wash a lot. And they didn't get sick, and they thrived. Because the people obeyed. And I, th I think we need people in every arena of society, specifically in politics, that have the ability to both know and do the right thing. And here's the other thing. We need people in politics that are prophetic, meaning they take on the king. Prophets and kings usually don't get along. Prophets, kings, and priests usually don't get along in Scripture. And that's okay. Because they're representing different understandings and different viewpoints. The prophet is trying to give a, a God's eye view of a situation, which oftentimes the mob doesn't like. Because the mob's often wrong. The king is trying to just, you know, like, get water and food and make sure that the, the, the walls are okay. That we don't get taken over. They're very pragmatic about how things work. Well, that's all good and well because the, the society as a whole has got to make some hard decisions. But what ends up happening typically when you're thinking about the macro is the micro gets lost. The individual one person gets lost. When you think about the whole flock, a couple of sheep may not matter. That's where the priest gets involved. The priest says, oh, no, 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 no. When that happens, you're going to hurt a lot of individuals. And the three of these people, whoever they are, have got to get together and they've got to submit one to another under the grace and power of God and work it out. So that the individual sheep don't get lost in the shuffle. But we need men and women who are given over to the Kaiosune who work in the power of God that's unmistakable. And they do more than they could ever hope or imagine 
by themselves. We need people that are all in. And so if they run for one term and they lose because they did something that the people didn't like, but they stood by their convictions, well, welcome to Elijah's school. That's what happened to him. Painful. But he also displayed a power that was unmistakable. Where are the Elijahs? Where are the Samuels that will look at a king and go, uh-uh, uh-uh, that's not the way we, that's not the way we do things. See, we, we've, we've got the examples of all of this. But we need men and women who are more committed to following in the way of Jesus they are being popular or rich or famous or powerful, right? What would you trade for your soul? The whole earth? See, that's a real question. And we need people that would go, that is as enticing to me as drinking from a soiled toilet bowl. I just want you to think about that. In light of the spring of fresh water that flows from the fount of God, how twisted a perception, how thirsty, how desperate, how how contorted would your worldview have to be in order for you to think that a toilet bowl is a good option? All of a sudden, it's not so tempting. Why? Because I know, I know whom I have believed in. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. We need moral leaders, leaders of leaders who are leading in the power and the spirit and the might and for the sake of the kingdom of God. And then the whole earth thrives as a result. That's, again, a very long answer to a very important question. Yes, yes, we have to work together. That is the plan of God, the body, mutual submission, Mutual empowerment. Amen. That seems like uh, as good as any place to kind of wrap things up for this evening. So can we uh, thank Dr. Black for being here with us? Thank you very much. As you said, he'll be around for uh, some more questions uh, if you want to come up afterward. But I just want to say thank you so much for each and every one of you for coming out here tonight. I encourage you. We still have a lot of snacks over here and uh, some fruit can and I, some cakes. Can I pray cakes. for them? Can I pray for you? I, I definitely want to do that. I just want to give one last announcement and okay. then turn it over to you if that's okay. And, uh, Leader and so, of leaders, huh? Uh, hey, there we go. And I didn't see Andrea and Dante and uh, Roger, a couple others that were helping out. Can we just thank the, the folks that were preparing that for us? And so please talk to at least one person uh, that uh, you haven't met yet, and preferably if you're kind of a millennial-ish person, maybe somebody's a little boomer and, you know, something like that kind of thing. That would be Ask great. Ask somebody what a letter is. Yeah, there you go. I know, cassettes. We're getting a lot of old school <laughs> history lessons here. So with that, uh, Gary, would you please yeah. leave us with a blessing? Father in heaven, I thank you for being our teacher tonight. I thank you for your presence here. I thank you for these people that you have gathered together under your name and for your sake. I pray a blessing on my brothers and sisters. For them, Father, yes, that they may know whom they have believed in, and may they become increasingly persuaded that you are able to keep that which they've committed to you, whatever that is, against that day. I pray a blessing on those that are here abiding with you together in this place. But Father, I also pray that these people and their love and their power and their gifts would cascade over the walls of this church and that their influence for your sake in your kingdom 
would cover this city like the waters cover the sea, that the knowledge of the glory of God in this place would dwell and abide in such a way that everyone would look at them and look at you and thank you, Father in heaven, for the work that they do. May they understand that for God so loved the world, you gave them these children. I pray these things in the name of the omnipotent Father, by the Son, and through the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, my fellow divine conspirators.